Okay, then we started. Maybe someone of you has also YouTube open? Okay, <laughs> just for double checking that everything's working. Okay, so here we are again, the first session of the new year of 2023. Um, great things had happened in astronomy recently, and yes, I hope there's also some time to talk about that. Um, but we have, of course, uh, another guest speaker today, and we and we are oh. really happy we to have, to have uh, Joshua Carter tonight here in our session. It's a uh, pretty a task for him to join us uh, directly from Japan. So we are really thankful that you take your that you take the time uh, to join us. And mm. yeah, I hope also that we will have some uh, time left uh, in the end to show some images. I don't know if any one of you was able to capture something because Europe was uh, the center of bad weather all over the world. I think it was really crazy since December. There was just nothing to do. Uh, don't know what's in the other parts, uh, what was going on there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I have also, uh, that I will not forget this, to show some of our viewers' images. We have some, yeah, let's say, resident viewers, which is really cool. And I want to say, bring a big shout out to them uh, to um, provide uh, new photos for every session. That's really cool. And I really love to show them here too. Okay, but now without further ado, I would uh, give uh, Joshua the stage to show oh. some of his images and talk a bit. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess I will just open up my, 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 my beautiful slideshow here. Um, let's see. Well, of course, nothing wants to work when I actually want it to. <laughs> oh, that uh, looks good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, great. Well, well, now you've seen everything before I can actually get it going. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So uh, here I am. Uh, thank you for having me, by the way. Um, uh, I will go ahead and get started. So um, my name is Joshua. I'm currently 31 soon to be 32 cry um I'm, I'm originally from arkansas in the united states uh but uh i moved to japan to start a family with my wonderful wife who is uh, sleeping right now lucky um and and uh i'm living in wakayama wakayama prefecture it's uh I don't know if anyone maybe has heard of it, but uh, it's a very beautiful place. Um, I, I, I'm i not a big fancy engineer or anything. Like most foreigners that move to Japan, I am a language teacher. Um, I work at a small English language school. And uh, the one benefit of working at a small private school is that the salary is very nice, so I can afford my hobby. Uh, that is maybe the best uh, quality of my job. And I get to share my images with enthusiastic Japanese young children, and they are my number one fans, so they make me feel 100% better about my work. Um, I guess I can go ahead and start with Mr. Sagan here. Uh, like most people, uh, the, the popular uh, science uh, outreach, pr the the best of all time, the GOAT. Uh, Carl Sagan is one of the reasons I got into astronomy in the first place and science in general. Uh, I own all but one of his books. Uh, I'm still looking for it somewhere online. But uh, he is maybe the biggest influence uh, in my life as far as science goes. Uh, but the, I guess I should give credit where credit is due. Uh, the real reason I got into science in the first place was because of my grandmother. Um, most people, when they go to bed, when they're a small child, their parents or their grandparents will read them a story and good night, see you in the morning. But my grandmother was very stubborn. So uh, she would ask me, instead of telling me a good night story, she would ask me, what did you learn today? 
So uh, she always encouraged me to be curious. And if I didn't learn anything that day, she would get me out of bed and uh, run me to the bookshelf or you know something in order to solidify my knowledge for that day. Even if it was something very small, she would always encourage me to learn something new every day. And I am happy to say that 31 years later, I am still doing that. Uh, it is a task most days, but um, I, I do try to live up to her legacy every day. So um, because of her uh, pushing me to learn something new every day, I think I naturally went towards the sciences because there's new papers being published every day so I can learn something. Um, I think I started mainly um, watching TV like most young children do, but I didn't watch cartoons. I watched PBS uh, and uh, the public broadcast service in America used to be a very, very good place to learn things. I'm not so sure anymore, but uh, back then they would show reruns of Cosmos and I was just blown away by the knowledge that you could learn from a 30 minute TV show. Um, of course, I I was born in 1991, so I was I grew up in the age of Hubble, which is something that I'm I think I'm very lucky for. Uh, all of us, we live in a really great time right now where we can just open our computer and oh, what's the new James Webb image <laughs> or something? You know, it's uh, we live in a really great time. Uh, for science, especially, and uh, it's and really, really great time for space exploration. Um, also, I have to give credit to all of the the teachers that uh, have been a positive influence in my life. Um, I'm originally a musician, so I think my music teacher, uh, Steve Warner. I, I hope he's watching, but. Um, uh, Steve Warner, if you're watching this, thank you so much uh, for being a guiding force in my life. Um, but um, there are many other teachers that have had a very positive influence on me and helped guide me in the right direction, even though I can sometimes be quite stubborn. Um, all right. Um, so when I first realized that I can also take images like Hubble, the Hubble telescope. Um, I was instantly hooked. Um, I started watching videos on YouTube and YouTube did YouTube things. And I was recommended some really cool videos. I would look up videos um, for science and, uh, oh, what's the new discovery for today? Um, uh, and I was just naturally recommended videos by how I think a lot of people get into the hobby now, um, Trevor Jones, uh, Astro Backyard. Um, I think a lot of people who are in the hobby now, if it wasn't for him, uh, many people would not even know astrophotography exists. So uh, I think even though it might seem slightly cliche, uh, I think Trevor Jones is maybe the biggest influence in me getting into astrophotography. Uh, the other YouTube king is uh, Chuck Ayub. He is uh, also a big influence on me. Um, but like I told you in the beginning, I like to learn something new every day. So I didn't instantly jump into the hobby. I did a lot of research. Um, uh, I almost didn't get into the hobby because my research showed me that it was very expensive. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, there are so many sources that show you that you can do great astronomy with just a DSLR and a tripod, uh, like the image that you can see here. Uh, this image was taken. It's the cliche looking at the Milky Way with the spotlight. Uh, but it was one of my really, it was one of my first, uh, attempts at astrophotography. Um, when I started to do more research into the hobby, and seeing what do I really want to do, um, I stumbled upon Astrobin, um, which I think, I, I don't know if, some some astrophotographers in Japan, actually, they don't know of Astrobin, and I'm always very shocked. 
Um, but uh, Astrobin, Astrobin is a great resource. And because I was stumbled upon Astrobin, I think uh, my standard from the very beginning was very high. Um, I, I, re I still remember the, the first day I went to Astrobin, the image of the day was by an astrophotographer named Richard Sweeney. And he, I think at the time, uh, he was using, uh, I think, uh, Takahashi Epsilon telescope and a few other things. And, but his images are just breathtakingly beautiful. Um, um, also Adam Block, who is the king of Pix Insight, you, you would think he coded the program, <laughs> how much he knows about it. But, um, uh, Adam Block for sure is maybe still the biggest guiding influence in this hobby for me. Um, uh, I mentioned Richard Sweeney also, uh, the influencer, Nico, Nico Carver. Um, I, I call him an influencer, but he is a really, really great astrophotographer and a really great person as well. Um, also, um, Andy Ermoli, he is, in my opinion, one of the best astrophotographers. Uh, if you do not know who he is, uh, I I don't think he uses Astrobin anymore. I think he uses uh, Flickr, but look him up on there. He is an absolute beast of a photographer. And um, last on my list, I don't think he needs any introduction I will just let his name sit there and stew a little bit. Um, I think on Astrobin in the very beginning, even back then, his team were were making discoveries, and uh, it's 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 amazing uh, what you can do with some equipment. So if it wasn't for this small list of people, I think I uh, maybe would have passed up on this hobby, but. Uh, thanks to these people, this list of people, there are a few more, of course, but uh, I think these are these people are the most influential. So when I decided to get into the hobby, I had just moved to Japan and uh, like most foreigners who, who moved to a new country, my my funds were a little low. I was still getting used to paying all of the taxes and all the moving fees and you know getting a getting a vehicle and doing those things so i didn't have a lot of money to start out but you do not need a lot of money to get started in astrophotography you don't have to have the best equipment um, but the one thing i did want to make sure i had was some kind of tracking mount with go to functionality uh, i'm i'm kind of lazy so i I could have gotten a star adventurer or a star guy. Uh, what, what is it called? The ioptron. Uh, Sky guider. Sky guider. Yeah. Okay. I was right. Sorry. Uh, I could have gotten one of those, but I, I'm lazy. So I wanted something with go-to functionality. And I read that uh, a lot of people in Japan were using the, the um, Skywatcher uh, AZ GTI. And I was like, oh, that's that's weird. Isn't that an alt house mount? Uh, oh, but you, well, well, you can use it in EQ mode, and that's uh, really, really cool. And it's, it's relatively cheap. Uh, the tracking is a little questionable. You definitely need guiding. Uh, I learned that the hard way. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I started out with things that I had. Uh, I love doing um, wildlife photography as well, like mostly birds and deer and things like that, things that I had back home in. Arkansas, uh, lots of animals. It's called the natural state for a reason. Uh, it, lots of really beautiful wildlife and forests, mountains, things like that. But I had an old, uh, an old uh, Canon T3i. I had the the stock zoom lens that it came with, and I also had a 300 millimeter lens that I used for photography. Um, and I used those starting out. Um, this image is actually the second picture that I took with my gear. Uh, we went, me and my family, my, my wife and her mother, we went out to this onsen, which is a, a hot a, a hot spring, Japanese hot spring. And it's in the middle of nowhere. 
literally there's 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 nothing around it's just dark and it so first it was my first time ever seeing the milky way and it was my it was also my first time imaging the milky way so uh double trouble on that one um but i but i started with this is just with the stock lens i i'm, I'm sure you can see all of the purple fringing there somewhere but uh the stock lens works work, worked great for me. I was able to capture a lot of detail and uh, I didn't quite know what I was doing with the stacking. So the background is a little blurred, but uh, this is one of my first pictures taken with the gear that I started with. Um, here are some other images that I took with the gear that I just listed, the 300 millimeter uh, Canon uh, L lens and a stock camera. Uh, I've never had any of my cameras modified uh, I, I would like to, but, uh, I think if you were in dark enough skies, um, you tend to get a lot of response out of the emission nebulae. So, uh, this image here of the, the, uh, lagoon and Triffid nebula, this is actually my first astrophoto. Really? The first image that I ever took, uh, was at that, was at that location, that onsen. I didn't know what I was doing for polar alignment. I just kind of pointed the I kind of pointed the mountain north and I used an app to kind of help me find where where the North Star might be. And I put in my program to slew to the Eagle Nebula actually. I wanted to image the Eagle Nebula, but the go-to was not really good. So it actually went to this region and I just Im I just ended up imaging this for a few hours. Uh, basically until my uh, my camera died, uh, which was unfortunate because I also needed to take darks and flats. Uh, but that's another story. Lear the learning process is ongoing. Uh, the other image that the other images you can see are my second and third pictures uh, of uh, the Orion Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, I I'm lucky enough to live in a place where we have uh, many rural areas uh, and most places I can go that are dark. They're just right down the road. So I I I, I drove with my small little AZ GTI and my camera and everything. And I was I was imaging as much as I could when I first started. Um, I didn't know much about processing back then. But uh, I tried my best, and I think I got good results for just starting out in the hobby. Um, after I decided that I really, really, really liked what I was doing, uh, I decided to upgrade my equipment. Um, as you can see, I don't think I would set my equipment up like this anymore, but uh, I was very proud of myself for buying my first big boy telescope. and. Uh, uh, you can see the the uh, ASI Air there at the top. Um, I wasn't. I was a little intimidated by using a mini PC or a laptop uh, because it can get quite humid in Japan, and I didn't want to ruin my laptop with letting it sit outside and getting soaking wet. So I decided to go with the the ASI Air instead. Um, the ASI Air, I think, is a really good product. Um, if you decide to stick with the ZWO ecosystem. It's, it's, it works really well. Um, I researched a lot of small telescopes that would work with my mount um, because I, I the AZGTI has a payload uh, a capacity of five kilograms. Um, you can see a counterweight system on this mount as well. Uh, it's really not made to be used this way, but it can be. Um, this is this is a set that you can buy. Uh, it's it's just a vix. It's a vixen counter uh, counterweight shaft that has M12 threads and a uh, one kilogram vixen uh, counterweight. It is not balanced in this picture. Please do not take my picture as uh, an example. Uh, this is the first time I set it up, and I was very happy. Um, but uh, this is the equipment that I really started out with. Um, I will, I will point out that I'm sure some people will understand, uh, in some countries you have a lot of trouble 
getting specific brands. Um, maybe the vent, maybe your vendor doesn't sell them, or maybe the import fees are too high for the vendor to uh, justify spending the spending the extra money to get the instrument, the OTA or the mounts to your country. Um, I think the same goes for Japan. Uh, Japan is. I wouldn't say they're a very private country, but I, I will say that they they tend to push Japanese equipment a lot, um, like Vixen, Takahashi, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, there are a few rebranded uh, Senta products in Japan as well called Kinko. They're a really famous uh, telescope or telescope. I'm sorry, uh, camera company, um, and they also sell some astronomy equipment under under the name Kinko, which is which is just rebranded Senta products. But as you can see in this picture, I decided to go with a 70 millimeter Mead telescope. Um, I decided on Mead mainly because uh, I, I, at the time I thought Mead was a, a well-known brand. I think when I when I thought at when I thought of a telescope, I thought of Mead mainly because. Um, the astronomy club at my university, they had Mead telescopes, um, not much unlike the one sitting behind you there. Uh, uh, so I thought, oh, well, this, uh, this, this telescope screams quality. So I decided to go with um, a relatively fast uh, astrograph, um, F5 70 millimeter APO. It, 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 it's a Petzval design. So I didn't have to have any worries about back focus or spacing or anything like that. Uh, just get the stars and focused and shoot away. And it worked really great. Um, I, I think when I wrote this slideshow, I was being a little sarcastic. Um, under the under the ZWASIR thing, it says easy as one, two, three. Hmm. Well, I found out really quick that it's not always as easy as you think. Um, but with the ASIR, I was I was able to image from home. I was able to image uh, out in the field relatively quickly. I could polar align, get everything set up all in the app, and it was very uh, convenient. Um, these are these are some of the images that I took with that camera and my lens from home. Granted, uh, so these aren't quite as good as some of the first images I took, but they're from home. So um, I think. At, at the time, I was very excited, but I wasn't really happy. Um, I wanted, I saw these images on AstroBen, and I I wanted the quality that they got. So I wasn't really satisfied. So I decided to buy my first um, uh, dedicated camera. Um, I decided to go with a mono sensor because, uh, yeah, falling down the rabbit hole. It's uh, it's been never ending ever since. Um, <laughs> Um, but I decided to I, I, I decided to go with a mono sensor um, mainly because uh, during my research I found that uh, if you live in light polluted areas I think monochrome tends to be better even if you shoot LRGB monochrome tends to be better uh, you can remove gradients a little bit better um, just in my research um, uh, great. <laughs> which is kind of ironic because now I use a color camera, <laughs> but any, anyways, um, I decided to upgrade my gear. Um, I think testing the limits of your gear is also, uh, really, a really important part of this hobby. Um, but when you, when you push your gear to the, to its limits, I think, you realize that, well, maybe it's time for an upgrade. So I did upgrade my camera and I upgraded a few other things. But I also got I also had to deal with the learning curves that come with getting new equipment. And uh, sometimes this can be a big turnoff. But for me, it was very exciting. Um, I, I still remember my my very first uh, narrow band image coming in. It was it was HA. It was the uh, it was NGC 7000, the North American Nebula. And I was like, wow, this is nothing like what I was getting with my DSLR. And I was hooked. So, um, so 
here is the here is the big difference between a cooled monochrome sensor and an old DSLR. Um, I think the difference is quite dramatic. The quality and detail that you can get out of narrow narrowband filters and with, with a monochrome sensor, I think is unmatched. Um, these are just a few of the images that I took from my house, uh, which is in a Bortle 5 area. Um, the, jelly, the jellyfish here is uh, a, a little over 20, 24 hours of data. And the other images um, are just, a, I think, a little bit around seven or eight hours. So uh, please take these images with a grain of salt. It was my first time. Uh, um, when in doubt, get a bigger mount. Um, I realized very quickly that my, my poor little AZ GTI could not handle my gear. So I decided to upgrade my equipment and buy the EQ6R. Um, I think when I took this picture, I wanted to convince everyone I was in Japan. So, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, as you can see, my 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 wonderful Japanese garden here in the back. Uh, but um, yeah, th this was a this is maybe the best improvement that I ever made to my equipment. Um, I I think I should have listened to a lot of the people when they told me the best the best thing you can do to start out in this hobby is invest in a good mount. Uh, well. I learned that the hard way and I decided to upgrade later on. But if you are just starting out, the mount is the most important part of uh, any astro, uh, any astrophotography gear or astronomy gear in, in, in general. Um, but with this mount, I had room to grow. I was getting better quality images because my guiding was better. Um, out of the box, it was a little stiff, so I did have to hyper tune it, but uh, that's a long story. And more learning curves, more learning curves. Oh, there's always learning. Uh, there's always something to learn every day. I think maybe it's a curse at this point, but um, there's always something to learn, more learning curves. But I was very pleased with the images that I was getting. And I think other, other people were pleased too, um, because uh, I was actually approached by um, one of the representatives of Mead to help represent their company. And I thought I, I took that as a uh, very big compliment. So J I was Joshua, able to- May I interrupt you just shortly? Yes. Um, <laughs> what camera do you use here? Oh, um, this is the the 1600, the 1600 monochrome. Ah, okay. So, so uh, yeah. this is an, uh, I think MFT, micro four thirds sensor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still use this camera all the time. I think it's still a really, really good camera. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I I think there are there are there are other options, but in 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 this, if you want a chip that's this size, um, as far as calibration frames and everything goes, mm -hmm. I still think it's a really, really easy and user friendly camera. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. Um, so I, so like I said, I was approached and I was able to become a Mead brand ambassador. Woo. So I was very excited at the time. Um, but <laughs> I think maybe it was bad timing because um, <laughs> I was only a Mead brand ambassador for a few months and then <laughs> bye bye. So, yeah. uh, so it was good while it lasted. Um, my information is still on their website. Um, Orion did finally uh, put up the Mead website again, so that's great. They kept it the same, but uh, uh, Mead is not out of well. Mead was bought by Orion, so they you can still buy Mead products. No, no worry there. But uh, I haven't gotten any updates in over a year from Mead, so I'm assuming this does not count anymore. But it was good while it lasted. It was fun. I had a lot of good perks. Uh, they would send me some stuff like, uh, they would send me eyepieces and cool stuff. It was really cool. It was a really good opportunity. Um, 
I got a lot of exposure and it was really fun while it lasted. Um, after, after a while, um, I kind of realized that if I could go back, I would have started with something a lot, a lot more simple. So that's what I did. I, um, as I mentioned, uh, earlier, I'm, I'm originally a musician and I studied music in university. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a saxophonist by, by nature and a piano player, but, um, a lot of my best teachers, it, they always taught me that if you ever feel self-doubt, the best thing to do is just start over. Um, buy a new mouthpiece, buy a new horn, uh, buy some new uh, technique books, try something new. So I took that advice and applied it to uh, astrophotography. So I, so I went out, I got a, I got a star tracker, um, I, I upgraded my DSLR to a full frame six, uh, Canon 6D, which is still a really, really solid camera. Um, and I, I purchased a, the, um, 135 F2 lens by Sam Yang. Uh, in some countries it's, uh, branded as Rokinon. So, uh, I also included that, but in Japan, uh, we import them as Sam Yang. Um, I also made it a I also made it a goal to drive out to darker skies when I image uh when I can. Um so that's what I did. I went out usually I tried to go around new moon like most of us do to darker skies and image. Uh these are some of the images that I've taken from a few of the dark sky sites around my around my home in Japan. Um, these are all taken with the Canon 6D and the Rokinon 135 lens. I think this is a really good uh, starter pack, as if you could say, for um, astronomy for astrophotography. Um, maybe maybe my maybe I pushed the processing a little too hard in these images, but I was I was uh, very excited. And that and this is a stock camera. Um, I think the especially in the Canon 6D, the HA response is quite good. Um, here's another image that was taken uh, with that setup of the Witch Head Nebula and the very bright star Rigel sitting next door. I've talked a lot about uh, dark skies in Japan. And I think a lot of people have misconceptions about Japan. Um, so Japan is roughly the size of California in America. I say roughly, uh, Japan is a lot of islands. So when you put them all together, uh, it's roughly the size of California, but, um, only 16% of the land mass is livable. I say livable because most of the land is rugged. It's mostly mountains, uh, river valleys, things like that. People do live there, but it's mostly quite rugged land. So 16% of the land mass of Japan houses 127 million people. Uh, if, if you can think about that, 16%, 127 million people. Uh, so the light pollution can get quite bad. But that's only in a few, few areas. Uh, most of Japan is actually... Uh, rural countryside for farming, uh, rice, uh, radish, carrots, uh, small vegetables, uh, oranges are very popular where I'm from, or where I'm from, where I live, sorry. Uh, um, but I think uh, I'm, I'm in a chat, a group chat with a, with a few other astrophotographers, and one of them actually said, I just assumed that all of Japan was at least Portal 4. Uh, but, but that's not true. Um, uh, Japan has very, very pristine skies if you can go to the right places. Um, I am lucky enough to live in an area that is quite dark. Um, this is an image of Tokyo from the International Space Station. It is quite bright. Uh, 
the light dome can actually be seen from uh, a long way away of Tokyo. Um, I don't live close to Tokyo. I live, I live closer to the city called Osaka, but uh, you can still see the light dome from that city. So it is quite bright. A lot of these big cities are um, quite bright. 37 million people live in Tokyo uh, in the greater Tokyo area. So quite a big city. Um, but I live in Wakayama Prefecture. Wakayama is what I like to call the hidden gem of Japan. Not only does it have some of the best oranges in the world, uh, it, it also houses some of the darkest skies in Japan. Um, I don't think there are any Bortal 1 locations in Japan unless you go to the very southern islands, but uh, there are many Bortal 2 and Bortal 3 areas. Um, I think Wakayama is mainly uh, famous for its temples and shrines, which uh, you can see here. This is an image I took of uh, Nachi Falls. It's uh, one of the more beautiful locations in Wakayama, I think. And as you can see in this picture, it's cloudy. Yeah, uh, it's uh, that's the trade-off, I think. If you live in a place with dark skies, unless you live in the desert, it tends to be quite cloudy. So, um, But uh, Wakayama is a hidden gem. Um, I, I try to go camping and do photography as much as I can whenever the, the weather allows. Um, as you can see here, uh, so... I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, Wakayama, the city, the city of Wakayama is in the upper the upper corner, and it it is quite bright, but it's but it's still not as big and bright as Tokyo. Uh, Wakayama City is home to around three hundred thousand people, so it's not so big of a city. I think the I think the highest I, I think it's Bordel maybe six or seven I think. Um, I live very close to this city, uh, and my location is a Bortle 5. But as you can see, if you drive just a few minutes, a few minutes, uh, maybe an hour or two, you can get to some very pristine skies. Uh, all of this blue area here is Wakayama Prefecture. These are just a few of the images that I've taken uh, from some of the dark skies in, Wak in Wakayama. Uh, I think, like I said, there are many misconceptions about Japan, but beautiful images and beautiful dark skies can be found. Uh, here's another image I took at a very famous rock formation called Hashikuiwa. It's uh, in Kushimoto, Japan. Uh, it's, it's the leftovers of, of, of a volcano. Uh, it's very, very cool. The history is also very interesting. Um, but like most of us, most of my imaging comes from home. Uh, and um, like, I, like I've mentioned, I live in a Bortle 5, Bortle 6 location. Um, I'm, I mostly image from the top of my shed. Uh, I, it wasn't meant for that originally. It was meant to store farming equipment, but now I'm putting it to good use and uh, using it for what it's meant to be used for. Uh, so... It gets me up above the houses for the most part. Uh, I do have a very uh, quite shoddy uh, view of the south, but uh, the north is uh, fair game for me. And there are plenty of things that rise in the north. Um, the gear that I use now mainly, um, as you can see in this image, I have an 8-inch SCT. This is a Celestron Edge telescope. Um, I, I mainly use this. I mainly use this uh, telescope now for uh, imaging planets and doing lunar photography, but um, I do take it out sometimes to shoot some of the uh, smaller galaxies during galaxy season. Uh, here's an image of M51 that I took with uh, the SCT and also the 1600 by ZWO, uh, monochrome. Um, this is from my this is from my house, so. Um, I was able to get some of the title tail out in my processing. And uh, this, this is one reason why I usually like to say monochrome is your friend. Um, uh, 
dynamic background extraction uh, can really help you out as far as things go when you are combining your uh, different monochrome uh, color channels. Um, here are some other images that I took from my house with the monochrome setup. Um, I think everyone, maybe everyone knows the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula, but my favorite area of this of this image is actually the Dark Nebula to the uh, to, on the lower section of the image. Uh, it reminds me of a big valley, and it's really cool. Um, the second image. Oh, I, I I can't remember this one now. Uh, I think it's SH two two four zero. Ah, I I I think I got that wrong. I can't remember, but it's 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 very close to or to to um the uh, Bernard's loop in Orion. Um, it's uh, what I like to call the uh, Bernard's loop's uh, younger brother. Uh, in Japan, in Japan, people call this nebula the Shi Nebula because it looks like the Japanese character. Uh, for she, uh, and well, the character she. Uh, um, so, uh, if you look up this image, you will, or if you look up this target, you will sometimes see it referred to as such. Yes. Um, 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 can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so, if anyone would like to know the location, the exact location, and just a simple way to call this nebula, it's the Eridanus loop, I think. Oh. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. Suhel, you want also? Yeah. So, Joshua, just to sorry to interrupt. Is it oh, yeah, true that the bigger the the sensor of your monochrome camera, it means you have a wider field to get more things? Um. Well, I mean, the, yeah. I I suppose the the lens is fixed. So at that point, the sensor is what determines your field of view. So. Um, I use a I use a very really, I use a really small sensor, uh, micro four thirds. So, um, if I was to shoot with a full frame camera, I would have gotten the entire uh, the entire complex. But uh, yeah, um, the bigger the sensor, usually the well, not usually the bigger the sensor, the more area of the sky you can pick up. But you do have to be careful that your 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 lens or telescope can handle the bigger sensor. Uh, I learned that the hard way as well. So uh, always make sure that uh, your your telescope or your camera lens is rated for full frame if you decide to go with the bigger sensor. Um, most lenses and telescopes can handle uh, APS-C sensors, so. Um, I think APS-C is the really the, the the great middle ground as far if you want a very large field of view with a wide with a wide field setup. Um, I like I mentioned before, I use a Canon 6D, which is a full frame camera, and uh, it's very very difficult to get good stars on the on the corners, even with my best telescopes. Uh, so do be aware of that if you want a very very large field of view with a full frame camera. Uh, backspacing and everything is very important the bigger you go. So, mm. Mm. It, are, it, are there any more questions or comments or anything? No? Okay. No. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Heart and Cell Nebula, um, but really this the heart and cell nebula are not the uh, the, the focus of this image. It's the uh, supernova remnant over to the right. Uh, I really wanted to get that out in my image. So I shot 32 hours of HA, uh, which in Japan is very hard to do. Uh, I think last year, last winter, or last fall, I should say, this was the only thing that I imaged. Every clear night, I would go out and image this area of the sky. So um, now I did upgrade my equipment recently. Um, I got a F4 Newtonian, uh, 200 millimeters. Um, and I was able to unlock the potential of uh, that great scope. Um, uh, 
if you are looking for a very for, for a relatively fast telescope that gives you a lot of good reach um, and a really really uh, tight field of view on some smaller nebulae or galaxies, uh, a Newtonian is the way to go. Um, if I could start over, I would have probably gotten a Newtonian from the very beginning. Uh, the the image quality and sharpness that you get once your telescope is collimated, I think is uh, unmatched. Um, but all of these images are taken from my home location, uh, which is really on the edge of Portal 6 now since they decided to install a big LED next to my house. So, um, uh, Like I said, I also image, I also do a lot of planetary imaging and lunar imaging from my house. Um, I really, I really enjoy doing lunar mosaics. I think it's one of the most fun things. People will maybe disagree with me, but uh, I think it's very, really fun. And you also get to do some moon exploring while you're shooting the images, or I should say videos, sorry. Uh, but uh, it's one of my favorite things to do in the hobby. Um, but it tends to be uh, cloudy around full moon at least. Uh, but um, lunar imaging and planetary imaging are very determined on your seeing conditions. Um, and my seeing conditions are not great, uh, but sometimes we do get the, rel the, uh, the very rare uh, clear nights where the jet stream decides to play nice and I can image. Um, like I, like I mentioned before, I like to go and uh, drive out to darker skies. And I realized very quickly that I can't just finish an image in one night. If I go out to these, even with the darkest skies in the world, some, you still need a lot of data. So I decided I love my F4 uh, Newtonian. Uh, I think I'll go with another Newtonian. Um, originally, I was looking at the the Takahashi Epsilon, which is a great scope. Uh, uh, I think Japanese quality is maybe unmatched as far as optical design, or as far as optical lenses are designed. Um, but uh, there was a two and a half year wait for that telescope. So I decided to go with another option. Uh, in, th in this image, I, I have the Sharp Star 130, but uh, this telescope is uh, sold by a few different vendors, um, TS being one of them. Uh, the 130, I think, is a very, very good telescope. Um, I have no complaints about this telescope at all. Um, uh, the images that I get out of this telescope are quite good. Um, and it's fast. So when I go to my dark sky locations, I can finish an image in one night. And it's great. Uh, F2.8 is incredibly fast. It's not RASA fast, but uh, it's not hyperstar fast, but it's a lot easier to collimate, uh, I will say, than a hyperstar. Uh, I have experience with a hyperstar, and uh, I think this telescope is a lot easier to collimate. Um, I, I'm on this telescope. I actually use a one-shot color camera, the uh, the two nine four MC Pro. Uh, you can see my Frankenstein of a uh, connection there that I have going on. Um, I had a custom adapter made by a gentleman here in Japan to adapt my camera and everything to my uh, to my telescope. So the the Sharp Star one thirty has it has an adapter for M48 threads, but underneath that, it has M uh, M54 threads, which, which is great because uh, that's exactly what I needed. So I had this custom rotator made to attach everything to my telescope. And that allows me to rotate the, the camera without rotating the focuser and messing up my collimation, which I work very, very hard for. Uh, some bonuses are that it's lightweight. Um, I can carry it with just my pinky, uh, which I have done a few times carrying all of my equipment uh, into my car very, very early in the morning. Uh, 
I think another plus is that it that it's uh, it comes with a carrying case, which a lot of smaller OTAs don't. Um, uh, and this is a huge plus if you if you decide to travel with your equipment. Uh, some some uh, as car shilling going on here, but uh, th the hat is great, by the way. Um, uh, here here are just a few images taken with the Sharp Star. Um, this is uh, this is the Pleiades M45 in in Japan. We call it Subaru, which uh, it's not a car. Uh, well, it is a car, but um, uh, the the name Subaru refers to uh, uh, being united as one. And uh, I think all of the stars are quite close together, so that makes sense. Uh, my favorite my favorite part of this image is actually the very very small galaxy. Uh, at the very top of the image, uh, I love I, I love that little guy. Um, but th this was actually imaged from my house, so th there's a big difference in the quality compared to a fast telescope, where you can shoot many fast, many short subs, and still you can kind of battle the light pollution. So um, I really like I really like that I can shoot many sixty second subs. Um, and get a really get so much dust detail and everything from my house. Um, my computer doesn't like it, but I love it. So um, here's another image. This is actually a joint effort between all of my telescopes. Actually, uh, my 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 Mead, my Newtonian, and my Sharp Start. So uh, these this is a combination of efforts. This is the Cocoon Nebula. Um, Really, 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 really love this target. Um, I think a lot of time you don't see the dust that's surrounding the nebula or the HA emission. Uh, it's also my my background today, so it's it's maybe my favorite image that I've taken. So um, here's the Orion Nebula. I don't I don't think it needs any introduction. Uh, but this was th th this was actually imaged not from my home, but from one of the Bortle two sites that I often visit. This is with a one shot, or actually, this is with my monochrome camera, I should say. Um, and uh, on the, this is uh, the the uh, the green comet. Most comets are green, but uh, uh, this is the um, what is it? C twenty twenty two E3. I don't think it needs any introduction now. It's been spammed all over social media. So, uh, but. The reason I like the reason I think this is really cool is because it, it, it was imaged on the 21st of January of January, which is when the island tail was quite active. And uh, I, I was able to get a lot of uh, detail out in the tail and I was really proud. It, it was my first time imaging a comet as well. So um, uh, I really I really like it. I wish uh, more big comets would come around. I have, I have to say that's also exceptional processing. The the oh, image well, processing uh, is great, really. Oh, thank you. Uh, you can thank Adam Block. <laughs> uh, it was his techniques that I used. Um, thank you, Adam Block. I don't know if you, <laughs> yes, but if you do, thank you so much. Um, the process is uh, uh, very, very CPU dependent. So if you have a fast PC, or if you're very patient like me, I, I basically removed the stars and I just in all of my images. So I just set it to go and I went to sleep. And when I woke up, it was there. So <laughs> it was good. So um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Um I'm I'm never quite pleased with my stars. Uh I I always want them smaller or bigger or more saturated or brighter or something. I uh I I'm not sure if you can see from uh, my screen share, but my stars tend to vary in all of my images because I, I'm just never, I think that's the thing that I focus on the most in the image. It's not really the nebula or anything. I, I focus so much on the stars and ah, it's a curse. So um, the other image is uh, uh, LDN1622, the Boogeyman Nebula. Um, this, this image is, uh, my, thank you. So thank you very thank you very much. Uh, uh, I was actually going to image M M78, uh, and I decided to image this instead. 
Thank you. Thank you for your recommendation. Uh, because of you, I was able to uh, win my win my first uh, A-Pod and my first A-Pod 2, all in a few days. So um, uh, this is this was quite a shock to me, actually. Um, I've submitted I've submitted a lot of images and I, I mean a lot of images. Look, every image I've ever took, I've submitted for APOD, like I think a lot of people do. And I'm not sure if this is their way of telling me to stop sending images, but uh, <laughs> uh, thank you guys at the NASA team for awarding me my APOD. Um, I think honestly, I'm more happy with the APOD too. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, maybe they would be hesitant to say thank you for the APOD, but a the APOD too, I'm very, very thankful for. Um, so, um, Woo, instant shill. Uh, so this is, uh, these are my final thoughts. Um, astrophotography is a uh, love and battle of passion. Uh, if you're, if you are, if you're passionate about space and space exploration, or just science and astronomy in general, I think this hobby is very rewarding. Uh, it shows us the beauty of the cosmos. It shows us that we aren't as small as we think we are. We are quite big in regards as uh, we have the capabilities to image these things. And uh, the universe is always around us. And all, all you have to do is just look up and click your, your camera shutter and it, it, it will be there. It is real. Uh, some people may disagree, but um, uh, it, it is quite real. Um, uh, it, it, if you've liked any of the images that I've shared, um, uh, this is uh, California Nebula, which is uh, appropriate since uh, Japan is around the same size as California. So, uh, so uh, if, if you liked any of my images, um, please consider uh, maybe following me on social media, um, my Instagram, Twitter. Um, I, I should note that my Twitter, I mostly tweet in Japanese, So, uh, but the Twitter translator is quite good. So uh, sometimes. <clears throat> it's uh it can be questionable other times but um uh it, if you like seeing random japanese and pretty pictures please consider following me on twitter i also have a vero uh, i don't really use it so much anymore but uh, it's there and i am planning on starting a youtube channel soon so uh coming soon to a theater near you uh yeah so um so yeah um with that i will I will end my little rant and uh, maybe if you have any questions or comments or anything, you're more than welcome to ask them. So, hmm. Joshua, first I want to thank you for that wonderful presentation. That was uh, really uh, stunning to see that very steep learning curve. And that's, uh, yeah. that's what I see uh, um, pretty often over the last time. These, uh, let's say, beginners and all with two or three years of experience I call beginners um, doing so wonderful, uh, such wonderful images here. That's fantastic. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think also a uh, reason is social media and all these online connections between each other. And yeah, you, you can learn so much from, from yeah, watching videos or just checking out what other people do. That's really great. Fantastic well, results. Well, well, we live in a time where that's, that's an option. I mean, um, as I told you, I'm originally a musician and I was, a, I was actually, a, I, I, I taught some music uh, in America when I lived there. So um, like private lessons and things like that. So, um, and it's, it's amazing what some of these younger generation, like I should say the children that I used to teach, it's amazing because they have so many resources now that they can if they want to know how to play an instrument correctly or if they they don't need that their parents don't need to pay me for for the lessons they can just go on youtube and you know and see a professional do it uh and i think that's a that, that's a that's a perk that a lot of uh i would say seasoned astrophotographers maybe they didn't have so um we live in an age of technology and uh yeah so I just wanted to add that uh, next time I have a presentation, 
that I would tell people who inspired me to start astrophotography, it will be Joshua. Oh. <laughs> You're on my list. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, thank you humble. for sharing uh, your passion. I'm just starting also to in this hobby. I have not done it before, so I'm already like skeptical about what am I gonna do, which equipment I'm gonna have, you know, like. But of course, experience uh, shows it all. While you get, you make mistakes, you get more better. So thanks for sharing it with us and to all the people who are watching. Thank you. Yeah, sure. could I just ask something um, regarding the sharp start? So, um, which is the biggest camera you've used with it? Um, I've used, uh, I I have used my my Canon 6D, and the the adapter that I have is, uh, I don't think it's the right backspacing and. Uh, I, I I knew you were going to ask about my corners. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, on on my Canon 6D, the corners are questionable, but I don't think that's a, a telescope thing. I think it's mainly a backspacing thing. Um, I have the William Optics uh, uh, EF adapter. It's really really well made. Uh, it's just a solid piece of aluminum. I mean, it's really, it just, it's really, it's really high quality. Uh, but I, I, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's quite right uh, back the the right uh, size. So uh, some spacers would probably help. But uh, I mainly use uh, a pretty small sensor, micro four thirds. Um, it's not the smallest sensor. It's not a one inch sensor, but um, uh, micro four thirds and the the corners they correct quite well. Um, I, I can show you an example, I suppose. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I will, I will show my, um, I'll show off my, uh, my, my APOD image, uh, because I worked really hard for, for this one. So, um, also, have you tried using blur, blur exterminator on that scan data? Because I suppose uh, it should fix the corners. Yeah. Um, so I, my my trial of blur exterminator actually expired so um oh. i have to, i have to buy it so, it's for all um, of us <laughs> uh, um it's, it's quite steep uh 100 so um uh but but i do think the easy processing suite the easy decon i think it works quite well and it mostly has the same effect if you can be very patient and wait for it to finish uh no, I mean, just uh, because I've seen sample images that it fixed corn stars, like it, they were elongated quite a lot and it fixed it like it was nothing. Yeah, I think um, I watched I watched an interview, I think, with um, Visible Dark with Russ Croman, where he th they talk about that. And uh, he mentioned something about the AI. Uh, it needs the stars to be at least close for them mm -hmm. to be recognized by the AI. So um, if your stars are just slightly elongated, I would say, yeah, that that's great. But if they are just, you know, if they're pretty pretty long boys, I think it's a, a lost cause. But um, yeah. uh, Blur Exterminator is great. Uh, I, I just have to convince my wife to let me spend a hundred dollars. So, uh, but yeah. Um, the the 130 uh, astrograph um it corrects quite well um i will say that the collimation is a learning curve and you can't quite rely on a laser uh but uh, my sample came with a uh, cat's eye eyepiece that you can use to help uh, finalize your collimation so i used that um and just to this image is not really cropped that much. It's just the stacking artifacts. So um, I will I will zoom in quite far on this big boy here, and you can see. I mean, all the way to the corner, the stars are round. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a great telescope um, compared to compared to other uh, 
more like more expensive, well-known brands like Takahashi, if you want something in this range, um, that's a very fast Newtonian hyperbolic uh, mirror. Um, th the price point is quite good. Um, uh, I'm not sure what it sells for uh, in Europe, but um, in Japan, it's uh, you may be sound, you may be safe around uh, maybe 50, 60,000 yen. So uh, that's quite a bit of money. That's maybe 500 euros or so. So. Yeah compared to the, the Epsilon 130, which is actually slower than the Sharp Star. It's, it's uh, F3.3, so um, yeah, but it's a great scope. I, I, I love it. Um, but like I mentioned when I answered the question about the, the bigger sensors and the big, uh, bigger field of view, uh, the bigger sensor you get, the, the more trouble you have. So um, the, as you know, the backspacing is very, very important with a full frame sensor. And at F2.8, it's, uh, it's almost an obsession. So maybe one day I will put a 2400 on there and see if I can get good results. But uh, until then, I, I, I like my hair, so I would like to not pull it out so much. So uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so no, no other questions. No, chat is also pretty silent. Ah. Um, I think you answered all possible questions. That was <laughs> really informative. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I've, uh, in the meantime, I just uh, looked for for an image. I've sh just quickly share my screen because we had talked about the hypergraph and the, and the full frame camera. Uh, just a moment. Uh, I found this one uh, from oh. the hypergraph, and I will also show you my. That's the folder. So I really, this is just a calibration, debayer, and registration. There was nothing done. And this is the California Nebula with the 2400. Uh, with this sample hypergraph that I had here, self-collimated, and here we can also go really far to the edge. And there was this was working at fifty-five at the exact backspace uh, at the exact given backspace of fifty-five millimeters. So mm -hmm. there is room for improvement, but honestly, as you said, for f two point eight scope, um, that's fantastic result. I was mm -hmm. so happy with it. Um, also, that I got it collimated within, uh, let's say, reasonable time. <laughs> yeah. If it, if one uh, owns it and you have time to to um, work on it, then it's not an issue. Uh, I always have not not much time to to do this. But yeah, this just as a side note from me. I think if you have issues with collimating, um, I. I don't know if this is quite common or not, but uh, using a bar load laser uh, is a very good method. Yeah. Um, because it really gets rid of the imperfections of your laser. I mean, yeah. it basically shows a, ref a reflection of your primary spot. So That's as long right. as your primary spot is centered, you can basically collimate your scope. Mm. to a very very close degree so yeah uh, if you're having issues with i mean and that's with any newtonian uh barlow laser is very very good yeah that's right mm. okay then um we can show some images i just uh, want to ask in the round does everybody have something to show or not or who has something yeah i've got a couple i've got two Images. Yeah. Okay. Sophie, anything from you? Yeah, the comment, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then, yeah, as, as you want. In the meantime, I can quickly collect the viewers' images. Does anyone want to share? I want to see the comment, Sophie. Okay, let's go. Um, one second. Okay. 
Okay, I hope this works. Uh, first off, thank you, Joshua, for your story. I really loved listening to it because we share so many similarities. And also, um, you mentioned the crack in the sky here. And I imaged it, <laughs> imaged it too recently. There it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love this region. <laughs> oh, and you're muted. I don't know if you just said something. Of course. Uh, my <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's great. I, it's my favorite part of that that part of the sky, honestly. So. Yeah, same. <laughs> All right. Um. So, the new image I got, well, two new images I got. First off, um, the wide field view of the comet. This was uh really really hard to get. I wrote a whole story about all the things <laughs> that were <laughs> that went wrong. I'm not gonna tell the story because. It's too long, and also I I left out quite a lot. Mostly those uh, the things I didn't want to share because they were like beginner mistakes I made. Like, can, can you click on it, please, that we see it in, yeah. in the full size? Here we go. That's fantastic. <clears throat> yeah, like solid. um, not closing, not stopping down my lens enough. I had boomerang stars in the corner, which I had to fix, and you know, those are all the stuff I left out, but. I was on oh, the overlay is pretty annoying. Hold on. I was really happy with the shooting star I got because I didn't plan. I mean, how can you plan for it? It was just <laughs> pure luck. And it's so, it's in the perfect spot of my framing and it's so bright <laughs> yeah. and huge. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was a really sweet res um, surprise, which I saw after coming home after this huge story of things failing and you know <laughs> if you if you want you can have a read did, but, did yeah. you recognize it while shooting or was it just like when you were at home that you saw it i didn't see it while i was outside okay <laughs> i saw two different ones up in the sky but not this one um yeah and um i got to test a new scope i got for testing and the new mount the harmonic drive well, the iOptron um, HEM44, the harmonic drive mount, which just came out. And I was pretty happy with it because that was the first light I got. And it just worked right out of the box. No issues. Like everything went wrong, but the iOptron and the TS scope, they did their job and I was just happy. So this is my comment result. The stars are really beautiful. I gotta say, I'm yeah. I'm a fan of uh, spikes, but well, they're pretty lovely. Maybe mm. I need to get <laughs> um, a refractor at one point. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> the trend but goes to multiple telescopes, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but especially like the big yellow star in here, it's just lovely. Yeah. It's so smooth. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. I will still keep the big scope, of course. So yeah, that's that's about it. I think... Your H those two HFG1, yeah. we, we haven't seen this yet, I believe. Yeah, those two... Well, 22 days ago and well, a month ago. But yeah, the last last live event is pretty long ago, was pretty long ago so here we go that was that's like, deep wow that was um every clear sky from october <laughs> to december <laughs> <laughs> and yeah they weren't a lot but i've used every hour i got <laughs> i was so desperate to get clear skies and now it's even worse because mm. like i couldn't image from home for the past month which is also why i drove four hours to get to the mountaintop to image the comet in minus 10 degrees celsius mm. with <laughs> while having never tried the new scope and mount before just being ready for everything to go wrong <laughs> yeah. yeah astrophotography is suffering it, it really is but <laughs> it's worth it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and here we go that was just a very quick image like four hours of integration time, but yeah, I just wanted to get something 
so my <laughs> social media feeds aren't dying, I guess. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the sharpness yeah. of this image, not gonna lie. That's the ONTC, right? Yes, yeah. that's my main scope, the eight inch ONTC. Fantastic. All right, so I think that's all from me so far. Okay, thank you very much. Peter, I believe you have a Statue of Liberty in your in your, uh, your desk. Yes, I do. There, <laughs> uh, the screen. Um, should be somewhere on the bottom of the... Yeah. There we go, right. So, yeah, I had a string of clear nights um, you know, actually, with, with with exceptionally good seeing for Cape Town, and uh, I used the Edge HD nine and a quarter, uh, and I shot the um, the Statue of Liberty nebula. I got about twenty five hours worth of uh, SHO data, and then I did various sort of um, versions, different palettes. Um, so this was one with a bit more red in it, um, with the stars in. And then I think my favorite version is this one here, which is more sort of Whoa. traditional um, Hubble palette where I remove the stars um, and um, and then sort of cropped a little bit to get the framing right. So this is, uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of this image. Uh, very happy with, with the outcome. Um, and that's pretty much, you know, that's, um, I did, get to a bottle one skies and uh, did a another version of um, the Carina nebula so this is um, ha RGB so the the RGB I got from bottle one and then when I got back to Cape Town I did the ha you know bottle seven in Cape Town is um, not great for RGB but uh, got the ha and uh, this is the final image for the uh, the Carina nebula. So this was about four hours worth of RGB from Bottle One in the Cedarburg Mountains, and, and then about Peter, um, would, would you mind uh, doing a full full screen, full frame? Uh, let me uh, just one second. Um, uh, right here we go. Yeah. Oh yeah, great. So, okay. Yeah, so I mean the Cedarburg skies are fantastic. I mean, as I said, Bottle One, um, we get up there about three hundred clear nights a year. Um, I really want to put a put a dedicated um, remote observatory up there. You know, that's my my long term dream because of the the the, the fantastic conditions and yeah. um, uh, amazing skies up there. So that is the dream. Um, so, uh, so that was the, the Carina Nebula and then, you know, going back and looking at a sort of full, full screen version of. Wow. Statue that's like a scene. painting. Crazy. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, they say the Edge HD is not a not particularly great telescope for DSOs. It's more of a planetary and lunar telescope, but, um, I think if it's well collimated, and you use the right camera. So this is with the 294 um, mm. So if you, if you use the right camera with the right pixel size, you can get fantastic results with that telescope. But you, you have also a reducer, uh, reducer in your HHD, or? Uh, this is the 0.7 uh, reducer. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty much the last three months worth of, <laughs> of mm. imaging. Uh, <laughs> I've got lots of data I need to process. It's the usual problem where, you know, I'm swimming in data, but there isn't the time to sit down and process it. So I'll have to catch up and show some more images next time around. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yasha, have have you something? Got you something? Um. Well, I have. 
one night of data um, <laughs> that I haven't really processed to its full potential yet. It's just stretch and maybe some story reduction. Uh, and I don't have it on the PC, so I cannot show it. Okay. Uh, I do have an information though. Um, but it's just um, how, how can I say this? It's um, I got me and my friend got uh, that we partnered together. Like uh, he borrowed me his telescopes and stuff. Um, so we use his. 533 mm and my Samyang mount and uh, filter O3, and we discovered new nebula and stuff. And we just discovered a few, I think last week on Thursday, two weeks ago on Thursday, uh, we got a mail from Pascal uh, that we have a new potential planetary nebula. <laughs> and it is already listed in. Uh, planetary nebula.net. Let me just show you. Um, share the screen. Okay, you can see it, right? You should be able to see it. Yeah, okay. So basically, this is how it looks like because it was not imaged yet. Okay, um, if you put here, um, the discovery with Sophie, uh, we can see it here. It already has images and looks like it has more information. Uh, but as you can see here, it's still an H HII region. So a star forming region. Uh, but for our, with my friend from Slovenia, uh, I don't think there's anything yet. Let me see, yeah. No status, status, yet, status yet. Minus 30. 33 degrees how did you image that not we from didn't home image it yet uh well my friend ah, has... it was a catalog uh catalog discovery or uh basically i was looking at this ah okay i understand I, yeah you see that that's the white dwarf and there's like page of mm. region around it uh but my friend so his name is jacob and that's his surname um he has access to chilescope from a yeah. Slovenian university in Nova Gorica, and they founded the 16 inch DSRC telescope. And we'll be slowly getting data there. Okay. As the nights are short, uh, it's summer there. And yeah, we're not the only ones using the scope for yeah, scientific sure. researchers. There's like a few more people, so we have to spare the time. Mm. Great. Uh, then we hope we cross fingers that that will come true. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I heard, uh, or I believe, over the next sessions we will also see images from Zuhel. I believe, maybe when you can polar line it and put all the equipment together, then you can also start off. And and you see, with a with a steep learning curve, you can achieve fantastic results. Hopefully, we'll have some good uh, weather, of course. Uh, yeah, the weather. <laughs> that's, why we, that's why we always greet each other with clear skies. <laughs> uh, so, yes, and uh, we're going to be testing out very soon uh, equipment we got from TTS. And uh, hopefully, our next session, I'll be sharing some images. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, Thanks. then I will show you also some of our viewers images uh, I got images from three people first let's start with Anders Langhoff he captured oh and I need to open my text document where I uh, noted some things um, I believe all from Europe so this is all also the reason why there are not too many images <laughs> But uh, this one here, of course, the, the lobster claw and the bubble nebula. Uh, nine hours SHO with a photo line 80 millimeter F6, flattener a tube tech 2600 mm, and Antlia filters and RGB stars. So that's pretty nice image, nice framing. Uh, I 
think the color is well i didn't see it pink yet but okay that's i think that's a special palette from uh, what's it called light vortex astronomy ah, someone. Okay. uh and the colors got uh pretty cool as you can see it's like from completely red to blue yeah that's right yeah um, there's also really nice like it blue, covers yeah. all the specters on the bubble you can see some green um this mm -hmm. purple yellow orange blue whatever you want that's definitely a nice approach yeah great okay then we i have to pay attention that i not close the wrong window here this was this one and then we have images from Randy bondo uh, from denmark oh that's all starting with a really nice one here uh, of course rosette nebula and i have also some informations about it an l extreme filter was used oh and the ts apu 100 oh nice one um oh i believe anders uh is writing in the chat right now just align channels no fancy scripts <laughs> Maybe that's about the previous image, but this uh, Rosette here is fantastic colors. Um, sorry, I missed that one. A 294 MC Pro, five hours of data with an AM5 mount. Also nice, ZWO AM5. Pretty nice. And he got, oh, oh there are more images from Rennie coming up. Messier 3, L Pro filter. Same camera, same equipment, four hours of data. Yeah, that's also pretty nice. And the third one, of course, the mighty horse head nebula with with this Alnitaki Air. I think that may be a bit overprocessed. Ellen Hans filter, also same camera, air yeah, only two point five hours. But this is just a current target for for most people right now in winter. Nice one. And the last one from Rene. Ah, okay. You know, we know it all. The comment. With an L Pro filter, 30 minutes. Yeah. So far so good. And we have also images from Andrea Divanich from Germany who is also a resident and oh there are some pretty nice things coming up here and i have oh there's not so much information about it i don't have integration times or something this is the ts100q also a very big apo and HAQ, heq5 pro mount and the canon eos ra nice pillars of creation here and let me check out the next one. There was an extra email that's, uh, of course, CTB1. And 32 hours of data, L Extreme filter, 32 hours. I still do not know how Andrea uh, achieved so long integration time. Yeah, that's, that's a deep one. To be honest, I haven't. Uh, captured CTP1 yet. I, it's on my list. I want to do it when I um, change the telescopes for a smaller one. Then that's definitely also on my list. And the last one also from Andrea is the, don't know, is it's called the Ghost of Cassiopeia? This uh, AC, IC63. Also the same, same equipment as mentioned. And that's pretty impressive how she. Um, uh, brought out these these blue regions here. That's impressive, and also not oversaturating the the star here. Pretty nice one. So thanks again to all the viewers for your submissions here. We are always uh, appreciated. Uh, just keep sending us your images. We will then uh, add them to the next. To the next session. Uh, to be honest, I haven't. Do I have something? Um, I have a new camera, 
by the way, I now went also mono again, and I choose the 6200, um, the ZWO ASI 6200 together with um, Optolong filters. And this was one of the first light images I did with it just, I don't know, an hour or so, hour of data, just to check out that everything is working. And I have to, yeah, just learn that camera because uh, processing 60 megapixel images is just, uh, yeah, that crashes my PC regularly. That's too too much. Uh, for the other images, I went to a two by two bin, which still uh, gives uh, 15 megapixel images, which is nice. That's also working here. Just a quick shot of uh, the double cluster in Perseus. Um, yeah, this was the were the first two images I, I did with this camera, and since then, only clouds, only clouds. Uh, so I hope that now with Galaxy Season I can, uh, yeah, use it more proper. Okay, so that was that was a pretty short um, image review, but yeah, we have to take what we can, and there was just not much more to do but to be honest in germany the weather forecast uh, looks pretty good for the next days but of course under full moon as usual uh yeah let's hope that <laughs> the next yeah do you know why because i'm going to travel to spain in a couple of days and <laughs> it's it's cursed like spain <laughs> had two months of clear skies in southern spain and Right now, it's still clear, but in three days, it's supposed to get cloudy right when I fly down there. And that's um, when it's going to be clear here. Like, Oh, what? my God. But <laughs> so, Sophie, can you just quickly tell us what your plan is in, in Spain? <laughs> <laughs> yes, setting up a remote observatory. That's because great. I just can't handle those cloud periods. Yeah, yeah. For for what equipment, or what equipment do you decide to put down there? Um, I put down my um, 2600 mm with the Antlia filters and the CEM70. Okay. And we will use uh, a TS scope 140 milli uh, millimeter. A refractor? Yes. Whoa. A big one. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Okay, yeah, then maybe you, uh, at least you should be able to polar line it. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Mm. I mean, telescope? at least, sorry? Which telescope? The 140? Uh, hold a... on. I just forgot Total. the name. And one second. <laughs> I think it's a photo line. Yeah. Yeah, it's the TS Optics photo line uh, super triplet. Okay, cool. Yeah, That's nice. because <laughs> I'm not going to put my Newton down there. I d it does a great job. It gives me great images, but once in a while it acts up and <laughs> 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 I need something that works yeah, for the sure. whole year and I don't want to have Definitely. to fly down there again or... Get yeah. someone else Did, to fix do, my stuff. Do you have some, let's say, emergency support there if a cable is r twisting around the mount or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There are uh, 77 other scopes right now. Okay, yeah. Which uh, which observatory are you using? Are you using EI or yeah, which one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay, yeah, then let's hope for for good weather and wish you a very nice trip down there. I hope you can keep us up with some, some news when you are there. Of course. <laughs> okay. Well, then yeah, we have reached the end of our little session. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you again for standing up so early for us. It was really impressive to see, to see your presentation. Well, thank you. Great story. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next session as usual in two months. We plan the next session uh, around the full moon. So with new images and new stories to tell. Thank you all and see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>